Hey, everybody, welcome to the last section, section three, uh, three out of three. And this section, we get into some things that are a little bit more speculative. We get into some sensitive areas. And uh, maybe I'm overly aware of that since I've been doing therapy and work with people for so long. I uh, always get concerned <clears throat> Excuse me, that uh, people are not offended or they're not taken aback on things. As Troy gets back into it, he's very well researched. And so, uh, you know, I trust what he's saying, but I'll also go back and check and verify. And if some of you out there have some counter information to it, write me back. I'd love to hear it. Write Troy back. Um, maybe we can even get you on and uh, go back and forth if you really understand this and look at this situation in a different way. I think that would be an incredible conversation to have. So anyway, sit back. You're going to get into, again, the most controversial part of the interview is coming up and very interesting. And hopefully you get a lot of different facts and information that will add to your life and how you live it, how you think about it. And if it's just entertainment, then I hope you're really entertained. All right, here's Troy picking up where we left off from uh, the second segment. Thanks. Uh, so the issue. So that goes back to what you were saying um, about that it's only been done one time in history, and that was with Tiberius. Yes. Now, here is, here's your denouement to the whole story. So you've got denouement. the idea. I, I'm yeah. not familiar with denouement. Uh, we've, we've, we've hit the uh, climax. This is Christ um, setting off the dominoes that would, you know, uh, well before he begins his ministry. Okay. Uh, but seeing the fruits of those dominoes literally happened in the year of his execution. Um, by the time he was executed, they were in a full-blown financial panic. And the Jerusalem temple was so scarred by this that by 70 AD, the Romans had, had, had finally had a, had a guts full. And uh, and basically the whole place was uh, was destroyed. Remember, Christ made the prophecy: "I I will tear this down and build it up in three days." Three days, yeah. Yeah. Okay. And he was talking about the true temple, as in the um, you know the the body of people who worship. But he also made the prophecy that you know not one stone will be left standing um, in this place, which was fulfilled when Titus went berserk and um, destroyed the temple and. and it was it the gold? The fire broke out, and all the gold ran through the bricks. So everybody pulled up the bricks to look, find the gold. Uh, so, you know, they um, that prophecy was fulfilled. But the the demise of that temple, the the very temple that Christ Christ's first public act in his ministry was to go in and chuck out the money changers. All right, uh, what Christ? If Christ was that manager, blame of embezzlements, but merely just working out. The um, uh, the jubilee that was expected in 26 AD. Uh, if he simply followed that, he had set in motion the very thing that would then basically bring ruin uh, to the temple in Jerusalem. Gotcha. So, so the denouement to this—that's the climax. All right. Yes. The, the, the denouement to this is why would Tiberius forfeit? Or, or get rid of all his money, okay? And as a little bit of background, what happened was that Tiberius, um, what happened was that he inherited a huge, huge amount of money from Augustus, all right? Uh, personal money. There's a lot of debate whether the, the, the amount means the personal amount or, or the full state treasury of the Roman Empire. Sure. Point is, it was, it was something in the region of 100 million sesterces, um at the time, which would be... Well, let's put it this way, you know, Warren Buffett and Bill Gates would be pocket change. Wow. Uh, in you know, in terms of his actual personal wealth. Now, the reason why I say that that he dumped the whole lot, and he didn't just, you know, he didn't say, look, you can have five percent of it, and we'll see how we go. All right. He didn't then come out and say, I'm only going to make this a loan. All right, like like most people would do. He just takes the whole lot and he says, let the Roman people use it. Let the Roman people use it. After all, I am their servant. All right. Now, if you go back into Deuteronomy, I remember that uh, Tiberius is um, uh, very much in contact. Uh, he has as a lifelong friend, this guy Thrasylus, who has um, yes. intimate yes. knowledge of, uh, of, of the writings of Moses. If you go back into Deuteronomy uh, 17, um, 17, 17, Chapter 17, verse 17, all right, uh, which I'll just simply go there now, all right. Basically, what we're told there 
in the context of, if you go back a couple of verses, it says, if you would set a king over you, this is God talking through Moses to the Israelite people. If you would set a king over you, all right, um, whom the Lord thy God will choose, uh, then uh, from among you, uh, if you set this king over you, you, you cannot set a stranger above you, uh, which is not thy brother, all right, not an Israelite, and so on. Okay, and he gives a whole other things. He shall not multiply horses to himself. In other words, the idea of God's idea of a good king is he doesn't create an army to himself. Uh, you know, he doesn't need an army to keep him in power. He should basically be a good judge of God's law, and that would be his protection. Okay? Yes. Okay, nor cause the people to return to Egypt, which is basically meaning not to go back into the secular slavery. world. They're now, yeah, all right, the, the, the slavery to the secular world, you know. Yeah. Uh, they are now God's priestly people, and that's how they should behave. Okay, not multiply horses, which we said, and so on. Um, and, uh, you know, not do these things. He shall not multiply wives to himself. You know, in those days they were polygamous to the extreme. Okay. So that his heart shall not turn away when he gives judgment. Um, and here is the key. Neither shall he greatly multiply to himself silver and gold. Okay. And it shall be when he sitteth on the throne of the kingdom that he shall write him a copy of the law in the book out of which uh, it, this is before the priests of the Levites, and he will keep that law to himself, it goes on to say, and such. And in this way, you can he would be guaranteed to be a good judge and serve his people. The key point there is that you don't multiply silver and gold. Here you've got Tiberius in the middle of a financial crisis, which I believe he could no doubt trace back to what was going on with the Gaulish rebellion uh, in terms of their not wanting interest uh, yeah. uh, payments. He had already seen how it was working in the Near East. I have no doubt he heard reports about um, Christ uh, chucking out the money changes. Probably, and this is high speculation, made the connection between Arimathea and Christ. And in consultation, said, what are these guys about? It's all about the interest. It's all about uh, um, how interest is serving and all that sort of stuff. Yet I am effectively a king of Rome you know, being the emperor and so on, what should I do? If I go back into their laws, one of the things it says is you don't multiply silver and gold. And this is what Tiberius does. He releases all his personal wealth and he literally starts to live as a recluse, but as a servant of the people. That becomes his, his, his mantra. I am not the ruler of my people. I am the servant. And, you know, he becomes the bane. Uh, to the Senate and all these people who would rule, you know, as a result of power, you know, guys in charge will do, will, will say what gets done. And he holds everybody in check and he rescues the whole situation uh, of this financial crisis started by these dominoes with the fall of the House of Malchus, the Purple House in, in Tyre. He, he rescues the whole situation by giving up his personal fortune only one time in history. So he saved Malchus and Tyre too, that, that company? No, he thing? didn't. They went bankrupt. The whole they deal did go, went bankrupt. Okay. What he saved was he saved Rome. From that chain, yeah. chain reaction. That chain reaction. He then, later on, uh, you know, sort of in the sequel to all this, of course, becomes extremely embroiled um, in uh, problems with um, a guy called Sejanus, who plays a role in all this that was too detailed to go into. Sejanus was running around in Egypt and was connected to the biggest uh, importer of goods um, uh, that um, uh, in, in Rome and so on like that, and probably represented uh, the vested interests uh, who wanted the status quo to remain. You know, um, what, what, what's with all this uh, cutting out interest and all this sort of stuff, all right? For me, the essence here is that... Um, you have a, a plausible storyline that shows how that which affected Rome in 33 AD was actually kicked off by what amounts to, a, a, you know, a claim, somebody calling him a rogue trader, who, in my opinion, obviously forgave his debts, and in so doing influenced um, the the, uh, the Roman. Um, uh, leader at that time who had intimate knowledge of the exact same laws that Jesus Christ would have been following if he were that rogue trader. 
And I'll just put one other thing. There is a, a particular story. I think it's in Luke. Um, I'd have to go in to get the actual details uh, where it is. Um, can't get it quite to hand. But there's a famous story where Christ talks about a conversation with a foreign prince. All right. And the prince means ruler. So he's basically the ruler of that thing, okay. uh, whatever that, 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 that place is. Now, in the context of Christ, it's either Judea or Syria, but it wasn't Syria because Syria was under governorship. It's either Judea or it's Rome. All right. So he's either talking to the ruler of, of, of Judea or he's talking to the ruler of Rome in this, um, in this uh, what do you call them, um, anecdote uh, that he gives. And the key uh, discussion point in this is if you would follow me, i.e., me as the embodiment of the word of God, you're a very rich man, sell everything you have and follow me. Do you remember that particular oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, part of it? I, uh, the I, eye of the nice needle. That was, that was the Yes, the it's in the context because... of all that. Yeah. Yes. And so the trouble is, is that in the Greek, and there are two versions of it in, the, in two different Gospels. One just says a rich man, <clears throat> but the other one actually says a prince. All right. And the prince really means a ruler. Okay. okay? All right. It's, 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 it's my contention, all right, that this ruler, not just a rich man, not just a merchant, it's my contention that this ruler was Tiberius ah. uh, at that particular time. Uh, because the story is told in anecdote, as in it didn't happen during the ministry. It's told about something that happened beforehand. So going back to your question, who was, who came into contact in the uh, um, Sacrovia, um uh, revolt in Gaul? You know, one can speculate, it's dangerous to do so, but... Uh, uh, in my opinion, it so um, completely covers the idea that Tiberius could have read those words, you shall not multiply silver and gold if you are a ruler, combined with what Christ tells a ruler, all right, to do. Um, because at the end of the day, let's face it, anybody who follows uh, Christ, uh, Paul talks about the crown of glory that you inherit. We are all destined to be kings. So the rule for kings is you don't go uh, trying to accumulate gold and silver to yourself um, in that way if you plan to rule with Christ. Yes, don't store up riches on, on earth. Store on them earth, up that's exactly right. the, the thing is there. In my opinion, did, did Tiberius, particularly because the financial crisis in, um, in uh, Rome actually came to a head just after the execution of Christ, um, did Tiberius actually simply make the decision uh you know based on these sorts of things well you know if, if if he was man enough to die for what he had to say you know should i uh should i maybe follow suit with what a good king should do according to these laws wow all right so it's, it's speculation mark uh and so on um and but if, if i it's a yeah. positive side to the story too, because you you think the rich man did didn't do it, but then if if the, if that's what was the motivation with Tiberius, yeah, now you've got something to say yet yeah, that that there are human beings that will give a wealth beyond anything other than probably what Solomon had, yeah. and was willing to give that up to follow Christ. Yeah, it it so seldom happens. Uh, I might be wrong. I've heard stories about people, you know, kings who gave up their wealth and, uh, you know, I mean, there's plenty of stories of kings who give up their power uh, yes. as such. But the point is, is that a king has power based on on the trust we all have in him to rule justly. Yes. All right. OK, I think this is what this is what Tiberius seems to have been reaching for, uh, especially in his latter years. Uh, but what I put it down to is a progression over his years going back to, to Rhodes. Uh, where he comes into contact, where he's, he's thrust into the, um, the the maelstrom of what's going on with Roman silver. You know, there's a, it's an economic war uh, that he's having to get his head around. And, uh, you know, it, 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 it culminates in, in one of the greatest financial panics in human history. Which then started by the time, what, in, in, in the 300 and... Was it 56 well, or some, something like that that Rome ended up, you know? Yeah, it took stuff. another few hundred years. Remember, in our previous discussion, as I said, there are times allotted 
um, to the um, you know the various kingdoms that rule on this earth uh, systems. Uh, they're given time to bring forth fruits uh, in the Christian, in the biblical scheme of things. You know, Babylon had some time, Persia had time, you know, Alexander the Greg's gang had had, had time, uh, and the Romans had a whole lot of time when they morphed into the Catholic Church. They had 1,260 years of time. Yes. Napoleon had time. Now we've got this banking establishment. They've been given time. Short uh, time. You know, Short it, time, but it's it's time. It's, it's time that's all in accordance when, when you do a good good study of uh, biblical law, you can see that it's, it's, it's just uh, time, um, you know, it, there's justice in it. Um, they cannot turn around and say, hey, man, you, you, you judged us before we were, just as we were getting it right. You gotcha. know, you see what I'm saying? So yeah. it, all, it all has that process. I've known plenty of people in my time who have come to an understanding of what the Anglo-American banking establishment is. Hey, it's Babylon. Hey, we got to do something about this. And you know, I, I would have been one of them uh, many years ago, you know, who felt, yeah, we've got to find a way to, you know, put a spanner in the works and overthrow it and all that. No, I'm perfectly happy uh, leaving that to God's justice. And what I'm saying with this whole discussion here with uh, putting forward a scenario of how Christ dealt with the, um, with the banking interests of what amounted to the temple in Jerusalem, because that was his focus was the destruction of that temple. You, temple. Uh, he really had to get rid of the, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the nastiness that was taking place in there. And it's one of the reasons why his ascension did not take place at the temple. It took place on the Mount of Olives, which was exactly uh, 200 uh, meters um, away from the temple, which in old biblical law, if you're going into exile, you have to move 200 meters away from the tabernacle uh, to begin your exile. You can't come within 200 meters of it. And quite simply, the old prophecies, just as Shiloh was abandoned by God back in the Old Testament in favor of Jerusalem at a later date, so Jerusalem was going to be abandoned. And that took place, I believe, when Christ ascended from the Mount of Olives. That was God saying, my post box is no longer this temple. Wow. All right. That's And, and, and that's why it was destroyed in 70 AD, uh, down through the line. But, you know, Joseph Farrell makes very good evidence uh, in, in, in Babylon's banks, this puts forward great evidence that shows the temple in its various forms in, in all cultures inevitably becomes the source of uh, uh, the, you know, the, the, this debt based financial system. Well, in Christ's day, it was a full blown money laundering, um, destructive, you know, uh, uh, system for the benefit of these guys that called themselves the high priests. You know, they, they, they were milking this to the extreme. Yeah. You know, and I think the Romans cottoned on, probably through, you know, probably through the efforts of the likes of Arimathea and uh, Christ, but they certainly cottoned on and, uh, you know, had to deal with it. And eventually in, in their way they did. It all, it all finished up in 70 AD and, 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 and it was gone. It, uh, uh, they destroyed it. But um, history chugs along and the system reinvents itself. Uh, over time and, you know, in come the bankers. And today we're, you know, as far as I'm concerned, the Federal Reserve is no different to how the Temple of Jerusalem was operating um, so, back in those days. So if we do a parallel, uh, which I remember last call uh, we talked about, you thought that there might be some kind of a parallel going on uh, yeah. for, for Christ's reappearance in, into, the, uh, into the midst of this, that, that first of all, I would say that the, you know, why wouldn't God put his son in the most luxurious business on earth? You know, the, the yes. purple of tire. So what would be the most luxurious business on earth that, you know, maybe he has an investment in now that, that there's something similar parallel in that. And that's speculation or fiction. I, I don't know, but mm -hmm. what, what do you do with that? Well, okay. Before I answer that, I think, sure. you know, this is dead right because, uh, you know, we have to look to this that, if, if my speculations, and I have to stress this to all those people, especially Christians out there, all right, that these are speculations based on what I know of biblical law and what I know would have affected Christ in his life, all right, uh, as in how he would have conducted himself, okay, had he gone into these, uh, uh, I, you know, these, these pursuits in his life. Um, most people would say, well, from the age of 12, he just simply honed his skills as a preacher, 
okay? Uh, but I don't believe so. I think that Christ had to go through the temptation of being a man of the world in order to understand what it's like for the rest of us. Yes. All right, okay? So, he, you know, he, you know, if he's some modicoddled, um, you know, uh, 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 guy who's just been groomed to be a preacher and he's been kept safe all those years until this moment arrives, it doesn't quite gel with the whole thing. If, if we go to Christ's um, temptation, remember the temptation, you can have all of this, if you bow down to me, you you know, uh, the, the temptation. Yeah, 40 days, be, it, uh, it's yeah. here is the, a question I was going to ask you off the record because in a, in a personally, I, I wondered what happened during those 40 days in that temptation, but now you're onto it perfect yeah, time. Yeah, well, you see, 40 days is the number for testing, all right, uh, time of testing, 40 years in the wilderness for the Israelites, 40, you know, days and nights in the ark for Noah, all this sort of thing, okay? And so 40 days in the wilderness really is the anecdotal story that Christ's, uh, Christ has given to us, I believe, of what he went through as an extremely rich man engaged in commerce. All right. Now, I'm saying he was engaged in commerce, that one of his interests was to have Malchus and Co. entire. That's, that's my speculation. But I have no doubt that um, Christ, when he spoke to the rich man how difficult it was, he himself had been tempted by this. He himself had been set up in such a way or had set himself up, worked in such a way where he could quite easily have followed the path of, of riches and luxury, uh, you know, based on his, uh, his own abilities. But when that, when that jubilee came around in 26 AD, all right, you know, he, he had to do it. He, 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 otherwise, he wasn't going to qualify as the Messiah. And it, it, the temptation in the wilderness, I think, relates to very much the time throughout his life as an adult of battling with these temptations. I don't, the, the Messiah could not have been above temptation. In fact, he had to have suffered temptation in order to under, to overcome it. Do you see what I'm saying? Oh, absolutely. You know, absolutely. Right? To understand it, to have an experience of it, yeah. to have empathy for what he is giving his life for. Yeah, and, 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 and to be able to present himself before the court of God as the risen Christ saying, I have overcome. Yes, all right. It, it just had to it had to be a part of his experience uh, during those times. And, you know, th th this is why I, I, I put down the Christ that I believe existed from the age of 12 and probably earlier. But from the age of 12 to the to the beginning of his ministry um, had a very privileged life, uh, but also probably based on working very, very hard in the commercial field. All right. Uh, that had to have been the uh, uh, the case, and and I think that's what the temptation in the wilderness uh, relates to us. Amazing. So, the the, the, the towards the, the the when did the temptation occur? The with... the temptation is related to us during the ministry. Okay. All right. Okay. So it wasn't at the end of the ministry. It was during the ministry. Sure. And um, I'm I'm going to throw something out here. I would say it could possibly have happened also in connection to the uh, when he went walking back to Tyre. You know, during his times they went walking. Okay, Tyre is a long way from Jerusalem uh, for a walk. Okay, uh, what I would say is that during the ministry he was still probably you know why am I doing this? I could be a rich guy making a lot of money. You know, I, I did pretty well before, but I have to be about my father's business. So I can't do it. You know, this is the temptation. This is the essence of, of what is going on. You know, you build up build up your wealth here. He's he's got absolutely. it. He's built up his wealth. It's not building it. He's yeah. got it, and now it's um, letting it go for yeah. uh, you know. A See, I, I used thing. to I used to think that Christ had given away all his wealth um, as part of you know becoming the Messiah and so on. But that's not really a requirement. The Jubilee doesn't say give up all your wealth, become poor. All right. What I believe happened was that Jesus Christ gave up all debts owed to them. Right. Okay. As part of that, then paid with his life for the for the for all eternity, all the debts owed to God by the whole of humanity. All right. Which is you know basically the, the wages of sin of death. He's a jubilee in himself then for mankind. Exactly. He is definitely that's creation jubilee and of course creations. Uh, the the final well not, not the final but the the, the culminating jubilee um, is basically the resurrection where all are freed um, from death uh, you know this 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 is the theology of uh, 
what it, what 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 a kinsman redeemer really is all about uh, in this case. But in terms of the actual uh, physical uh, existence that Christ had uh, on the earth at that time, um, it, he had to go through these processes. Now, I've just remembered what 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 I was going to. How do we relate that to what's going on today? In the book of Revelation, Christ, I think it's in the 17th uh, chapter, which is the last chapter, it says Christ is the essence of prophecy. All right. And what that means is that the life that Christ led is actually prophecy uh, in itself. All right. So this is what I mean by when I said uh, one of the first public act of Christ's first advent was to go in and chuck out all the bankers. You can expect that the first act of Christ's return, as it's called, is to chuck out all the bankers. Yes. All right. And so we go through that process. We can look at the Gospels and we can see a prophetic pattern for how his second advent will unfold. All right. Culminating not only in his, you know, in his first advent, it culminated in his resurrection and ascension. Okay. The second advent culminates in the resurrection and ascension of those who overcome. You see where I'm going with that? I'm, 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 I'm following you, but there's still a little something missing there. Okay. The, in Christ's time, his own life is, the, is representative of a prophetic, in, its, in itself, it's representative of a prophetic sequence of events. Sure. Right? He dies and he is resurrected himself. Yes. He's the first of many brethren. So we can expect in the second event, all right, that those who have died in Christ will be resurrected in the second event. All right. Okay. Okay. So he represents what happened back then for himself. But for the greater majority of the people who would be called the kingdom and those who are affected by the kingdom, there will be the resurrection of those who have overcome with Christ. All right. I, I'm one of these people who believe in two resurrections, the resurrection of the overcomers the, the, the kind uh, of people that Paul talked about, i.e. people who really commit themselves to being Christians. And yes. I also do believe in the resurrection of all humanity at a later date, creation's jubilee into the future, um, in which they themselves are also um, you know, brought into uh, oneness with God. But there is a period of time where Christ and the overcomers um, you know, rule, uh, you know, uh, th uh, through that period, all right? The thousand uh, year, the thousand year period. Some people call it a thousand year period or whatever. I just say it's the period. It, it, it's synonymous with the rule of David um, when David took over from Saul. In other words, Christ's return is is, is synonymous in, in biblical uh, prophetic models. Saul represents the period of time from Christ um, to um, uh, to today or to his second coming in which the church rules, all right? And then when Christ's return, it represents when the anointed David um, uh, actually comes into rule. And then you also have a period that is synonymous with um, or, or parallel to uh, Solomon's reign. Um, you know, so, mm -hmm. so where we're at with this then is is that, but, but it, there's a different mm -hmm. time frame a fast time frame or a faster time frame of what's going to be happening when he throws the bankers out this time, right? Yes and no. Um, so if we're taking Christ's life before and we're saying, you know, our first recorded instance of what Christ does after arriving back in uh, Judea at the age of 12, he turns up at a wedding, he turns the water into wine. That's a private affair. His first public event is, is out um, dealing with the bankers, which is what we could, which, which is what we were interested in. All right. Yes. In my speculations, I'm saying that the process that dealt with driving the bankers out and ultimately led um, to, you know, in 70 A.D., the destruction of that temple, the source of all the problems, actually was initiated in the jubilee of 26 A.D. All right. Yes. And he begins his ministry about his father's work, but. The process was initiated not by going about preaching and so on, but, but just simply following God's laws. This is, this is the point that I want people to, uh, to understand in terms of how we live uh, in the world today, is that Christ just simply uh, obeyed the commandment to forgive all debts uh, to himself. And, and that triggered off, uh, through no fault of his own, 
Uh, of course not. It's just that the system was right for that, and uh, it you know it, it, it was going to go. But the point is, you've got 26 AD right the way through to 30 AD, the beginning of his ministry, through to 33 AD, his execution and resurrection. All right. What I'm saying is that if the model of his life represents how he returns in the future, all right, and that that return is a process and not an event, then the process has been put in motion, I believe, and this is what I hope Christians hold out as a, uh, as a source of hope, um, the process has begun with an event, uh, the events that took place in 2008, 2009. Oh, okay. I got All right. You, you know, uh, now it, it's not exactly a correlation because the 120th Jubilee took place in 1993. Okay. And uh, we could say that, you know, a lot happened in 1993 uh, that built up, you know, to, you know, to, uh, to the problems that we have today, the financial crisis. However, I am saying that whatever is happening behind the scenes the risen living Christ is at work in exactly the same way as he was in 26 AD, if I'm correct, and just simply ad adhering to God's commands. And that the results of his actions in doing so will result in Babylon falling. Well, I'd be curious to, to know what happened in 1993, right? Yeah, I've, I've looked at it and so on. Um, the only thing that I can say about that is that when you look at 1993 as possibly a crossover between the Pentecostal church into the Davidic church, uh, which is um, uh, correlative with uh, if, if, if you've got the Passover period, which is Moses to Christ, and then from Christ um, to today, uh, we've had what's called the Pentecostal period when the uh, people in the upper room accepted um you know, uh, you know the, the, the speaking yeah. tongues at Pentecost, sure. right? We entered into the Pentecostal era um, of the called out ecclesia um, congregation of what would be God, all right? And that has been the church. Now, that Pentecostal era correlates with when so um, Saul, King Saul, was was placed as king. He ruled for 40 years, okay? Funny thing is, is that Saul ruled 40 years, Dave ruled 40 years, and um, Solomon ruled 40 years. Now, what's the likelihood of that? All right. Okay. There is there is definite symbolic significance in the uh, numbers that are involved. Okay. So the 40 years of Solomon, uh, Saul's rule match the period of time that the Pentecostal church, in terms of what happens, how people think, what they do. And Saul was in it for himself. He was... He wanted to make a dynasty and all that, and you can see that reflected in how the popes behave and even how Protestant churches behave, okay? what's When we come to 1993, the thing about changing from King Saul to King David is that there is a seven-year overlap between the two of them, all right? Saul dies. King David rules in Judah, the tribe of Judah, but King Saul's sons continue to rule in the rest of Israel. It's not till seven years later that Saul's legacy is finally put to rest and King David rules all of Israel. All right. So if we take that as a model from 1993 being a jubilee period, 120 jubilees after Adam, uh, a period where we could say the end of the Pentecostal era, the Saul era of the church um, took place, then we have a uh, we have a, this quasi seven year overlap before we enter into the period of time where we are ruled by a church that rules like David. Do you get what I'm, I'm talking about? Yes. And remember that Christ is the son of David, not the son of Saul. Yes. Okay. So there's a lot of, there's gray area there. And for Christians who are looking for prophetical fulfillment, do not fall into the trap that things happen as events. They happen as processes, all right? And for those who have wisdom, uh, the process is determined by how God's laws work, irrespective of whether nations follow them or not, all right? Okay. And it's those process, uh, process, you know, pr processes that, that um, uh, 
that we have to look for. And for me, the period of time that we're in is entirely to do with the process, not only of the changeover from the Pentecostal church into the uh, company of David or the church that will rule uh, like David ruled rather than like uh, Saul ruled. All right. It's the changeover also from a system that is controlled by Babylon, i.e. captivity by Babylon, into a system that can then start to institute these very uh, natural laws of debt forgiveness, jubilee, lack of interest, and and uh, one day and seven rest. Hmm. Wow, there's a lot, lot, lot to... Uh... To absorb in that, yeah. That's, <laughs> we've gone a lot further than I actually thought, but to answer that question, how do you look at Christ's life, particularly in some of the, uh, in light of the speculations to do with the uh, Malchus and Co. company going bust? All right, you know, could we put our finger on a particular company that is that version today? Uh, I, you know, I would uh, venture uh, the Lehman moment. Yes, uh, would be uh, um, would be one of them. Um, you know, one of them is possibly even the AIG moment that a lot of people sort of lost out on, on um, really looking at in comparison to Lehman. Uh, that would possibly be, uh, you know, that particular uh, event. But it is speculation, Mark. Um, but I think it's it, you know, it's worthwhile. It gives it gives hope. The thing is, you got to remember that the um, uh, if I'm placing events uh, in 26 AD. They did not come to knowledge in the greater, what you would call the mainstream media of the Roman Empire, until 31 to 32 AD. All right, so that gives you a good, uh, it gives you a good, you know, six years um, of uh, papering over. Oh yeah. Um, you know, before um, before it just it just the, the whole house of cards becomes untenable. Let's, uh, there's one thing that's kind of, a, again, another wild card I want to throw in here. We've talked about it and kind of passed over it a little bit. The temple and the rebuilding of the temple. Isn't there something that's supposed to happen in Israel with the rebuilding of the temple on top of the dome before all this occurs? No. Um, futurism uh, believes that a temple has to be rebuilt uh, in Jerusalem in order to fulfill the prophecies of Daniel. All right? And this is because... In the futuristic interpretation in which antichrists turn up and uh, you have Armageddons and all this sort of uh, deal, and, it's, and a lot of it is centered around this idea that 1948 signified the return of Israel um, to its homeland, and this was all prophesied, and it'll, it'll culminate in a, in a temple there. What I need people to understand is this. God made it very clear through his prophets that Jerusalem would no longer be his home. There would be a new Jerusalem. And this is often at the basis of what people think is a new temple. All right. Ah. The, the new temple and the temple that Christ came to build, because when David thought about building a temple, he was told, King David, he was told by God, uh, you got blood on your hands. It'll be uh, a son of yours who will do this. And, of course, everybody thought that when Solomon, his son and successor, built the great temple back then, this was fulfillment of that. But really, it was a messianic prophecy. It was fine to have the temple there, and God inhabited that, that temple because the Ark of the Covenant had been removed from Shiloh, the first resting place when Israel had entered into Israel. It had been removed from Shiloh, uh, basically because the high priest went crazy and started taking sexual favors for sacrifices and, and all this sort of stuff, and then stuck the ark in front of Israel when they fought the Philistines and thought that that would ensure they'd win the battle. So God gave up on Shiloh and said, you know, that's the end of Shiloh. And David said, I'll build a temple, and to do so I'll conquer Jerusalem where Melchizedek had originally uh, been ensconced back in the time of Abraham. And when he conquered it, uh, he said, right, I've conquered Jerusalem, city of peace, I'm going to build this temple. And God said, not for you to do, it's for one of your sons. They thought it was Solomon, but really the temple building was actually David's son who would be Jesus Christ, Christ being a son of David through lineage. Okay, And when Christ said, I will pull this down and build it up in three days, it had always been the uh, 
plan of God, that the true temple of God is the people of his kingdom. So the kingdom of God is constituted by people. Uh, the Israelites in the Old Testament who were a nation of priests, a special possession unto God, and so on. And it is their faith, their, their corporate faith, that ultimately makes the temple that God works in. And this is why Christ refers to the living temple. You, some of you will be pillars, some of you will be cornerstones. He refers to himself as the cornerstone of that uh -huh. temple. Okay? So the new Jerusalem and the new temple is really the um, acceptance by the congregated, called out uh, people who accept Christ as their Messiah. It is wherever two or more are gathered that constitute this kingdom um, and where they practice his, uh, his commandments and his laws. And, and so subsequently, it becomes a living kingdom that is not subject to a geographical area. Now, yeah. So the, the evangelicals and the Jews in Israel mm -hmm. or the Israelis, I don't are, are looking for something to happen. And it's almost seems like we talked earlier about some of the distractions or red herrings. Is yes. this, is this one of the things that people are looking for? While in the other hand, the magic is really going on. There is the, 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 the prophecies being fulfilled. Okay. The Israeli question, always very difficult because of a lot of um, issues and in the evangelical, um, Thinking, of course, it's the old story of uh, whoever curses my people will be cursed, whoever blesses them will be blessed. And this is yes. placed on the Jewish um, people who have uh, basically founded Israel, or Jewish people in general. If you ask any Jew uh, worth his salt uh, as such um, in terms of um, uh, their own Judaism and so on, uh, they will tell you that the only time that Israel could return to the promised land. And, and in my opinion, the promised land crossing the Jordan is that land that, you know, is, is the earth under the kingdom of God. It's not a geographical entity in the Middle East. It's, gotcha. it's, it's expanded so much further. But any Jew will tell you that returning to Jerusalem from diaspora can only be achieved with the Messiah. Well, Judaism rejected Jesus Christ as the Messiah. And that's fine. I haven't got a problem with that. That's their choice as such, all right? Yes. What I have a problem with is this Zionist Judaism, which an increasing amount of Jews do not recognize, has supplanted the Messiah with the idea that the Jewish people are, in fact, their own Messiah. In other words, they've got to take matters into their own hands. All right. And it's, it's been long enough. We want to get back, have our own country. We can't suffer another Holocaust. Therefore, we'll, we will we will go there and do it ourselves. All right. And you see, this is one of the reasons a lot of people tend to forget uh, with regards um, the the split in Judaism between uh, Zionist Jews and um, the, uh, you know, Judaism as a whole. Number one, uh, it's a minority of Jews that have returned to Israel. And the vast majority of them still live in the United States, Europe and other places in the world. And increasingly, many of them are starting to see the Israeli state as a potentially um, detrimental, uh, you know, uh, effect on their own safety. Now, a problem amounts to this for evangelical Christians. The reason they need to understand that the reason that the Zionist regime has called themselves Israelis. Have you ever wondered why they didn't call themselves Israelites? Yeah, no, I never thought, never even crossed my mind. It is simply because Israeli is the masculine. All right. Israelite is feminine. And Israelites were the nation of people who were to be the Messiah's bride. In calling themselves Israelis, they are basically stating to the world they are the groom, the Messiah themselves. Do you understand what I'm saying there? Yeah, it's pretty profound. Yeah. Okay. So that's what Zionism is. All right. It's basically an impatience. Uh, we, we reject Christ as Messiah. Uh, it's time that we got back to the land called Israel, and we're going to do it ourselves. Now, there is a distinct problem um, in Christians who then support this as prophetic fulfillment. 
uh, in relationship to um, uh, you know going into the uh, uh, promised land and and, uh, and 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 so subsequently they're going to build a temple there and fulfill all the prophecies as they relate in uh, Revelation and cause a bunch of a billion Arab people to to really be upset. <laughs> Oh yeah, Ups, yeah, upset about that plan, right? Yeah, Cause, yeah. Cause they've got the current temple on the the rock at this point. From yes, what I Yes, exactly. Yeah. The problem here is this: Christians need to understand that number one, God forsake the geographical location Jerusalem. All right, and as I pointed out before, this is one of the reasons why God in human form, as Christians accept Jesus Christ, when He ascended, He did so at the required distance that. Um, shows yourself going into exile from the tabernacle. 200 meters or something, yeah, right? Yeah, the, 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 the um, Mount of Olives, right? Mm -hmm. Now, the whole, you know, he's right there in Jerusalem for everybody to see, but he does it at exactly the distance required uh, by, the, um, by the law when going there. What I'm saying is that at that point in time, Jerusalem ceased to be the center of God's concern. I, I say it stopped being his post box, all right? It stopped being his address, um, for, for where it is. The other factor involved is this, and a lot of people are going to find this very difficult to deal with, but there is a struggle in the Bible between Jacob and Esau, which is very famous throughout the Bible. And the way that Jacob and Esau um, came to uh, problems was not so much that e you know, Esau was not a nice bloke. He really wasn't the kind of guy that uh, obviously God had in mind to, to think like God. He basically set about making himself a king by his own hand. And, you know, he was a hunter, uh, a very um, a very outgoing bloke, who at the end of the day did not care about his birthright. Okay? Now, what happened was he sold his birthright to Jacob. And so subsequently Jacob inherited the birthright. The birthright is the name Israel, which means, uh, you know, the nation of people who would live. So Jacob's name actually gets changed to Israel. Uh -huh. Okay, so it is through Jacob, not Esau, that you get the birthright name. The problem is, is that when Jacob then pulls the stunt with his mother of putting a whole lot of goat skins over him so he looks like Jacob, uh, so he looks like Esau, he goes in and the blind Isaac is fooled into giving um, uh, Jacob the blessing as well. Okay, now this was wrong. This was a crime. Uh, even though it worked to God's plan that the right brother got both the birthright name and also the blessing, Jacob had been wronged. Uh, sorry, Esau had been wronged. Okay, and the prophecy is that one day he would break uh, his brother's yoke off him and he would rule himself. Now, when you look at the prophecy to do with Esau Edom down through the line, a clear prophecy of theirs is that at some point they will take and hold the high places of worship again. What I'm postulating to people without going into too much detail is that on losing the blessing, Esau's descendants through the Amalekites right down to, remember a guy called uh, Herod who was an Idumean? Yes. A descendant of Esau. Esau's descendants have striven to once again inherit the blessing and also the... the um, the, the 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 true name, all right, uh, that was bestowed on Jacob. And as a result of that, uh, what you would call um, uh, deception and crime that was committed by Jacob, there was going to come a point in time when Jacob or Israel would itself be deceived by somebody bearing uh, the um, acting as somebody different. Okay, here's what I'm saying, which is very controversial. Esau Edom murdered its way into the temple in Jerusalem. Talmudic um, Judaism became uh, came under the auspices of the Edomites at the time, so that when Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea were part of the Sanhedrin, there were also these Edomites who supposedly by the law of God should not have been involved there. All right, so it's basically a family squabble that's going down. Yes. So Esau Edom is actually involved in there, all right, uh, at that time, murdering its way. When they disperse in 70 AD, Talmudic Judaism is a religion on the lamb. It doesn't have a home place. It has no temple or whatever. 
we know from history, and, and a lot of people hate this, but it is an actual fact, that the Khazar Empire by the 700s converted to Judaism. And that the vast majority of Jews, Ashkenazi Jews, have their origins with the Khazar people rather than from um, the, uh, um, the Middle East as the Sephardic Jews uh, actually do. All right. OK, not a problem at this point in time. They have their religion and they go about it. The problem is, is that Zionist Judaism, this Judaism that seeks to convert the Jewish people into their own messiah, all right, I believe is actually the manifestation of Esau Edom's continued desire to get one back over true Israel, Jacob. Jacob, yeah. All right. And that the trap that they've fallen into, all right, there will come a time when they will masquerade as Israel. All right. And they will um, they will take the old high places that have been uh, forsaken by God. Now, in my opinion, Zionist Judaism fits this, which is basically an Edomite uh, prophecy, fits this to a T. It has taken the high places. It has manifested itself under the name of Israel, a name that was given to the, the descendants of Jacob. They claim to be uh, Jacob, but they are not. Uh, hence the saying, those who say they are Jews are not Jews. All right. Now, the controversial aspect about this, I have to say, for people who would sort of say, oh, this smacks of anti-Semitism and all that sort of stuff, ask any Jew worth his salt, and they will tell you there has always been a problem with naming the state of Israel, Israel in the first place. Most of them said, no, the best we can do is call it Judah. All right. And, you know, the fact that they went in anyway, called it Israel, turned themselves into a secular state, adopted the name of Israelis, giving themselves a masculine uh, definition, which puts them at odds with the, with the coming Messiah, even of Judaism, let alone uh, the Christian Messiah being Christ. Right. Uh, in doing that, marks them, in my opinion, as Edomites seeking to get back that uh, which they sold for a mess of pottage. Wow. Yeah, that's, uh, you know, I, I, saw, I watched a video. Somebody sent me a video and said, you know, you're not going to see it. Maybe it was on Facebook. I got it off Facebook. But they said, you're not going to see this in the mainstream media. And it was a bunch of the Sephardic, I, don't, I think I'm saying that, Jews. Mm-hmm recently just within the last few days going to iran to award um the uh, ahmadinejad, yeah. ahmadinejad mm. with a with a and, and he was moved into tears and they were in tears and it was like they were thanking him for protecting the 50,000 jews yeah. that are living in tehran and taking good care of them and, and oh, yeah. thanking him and i'm like what how does this? I, I, it's really confusing because you know, as as a Christian and going down into Texas and 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 with um, you know the evangelicals and things like that, it was always like that. Exactly what you said. You know, don't curse the the Jews, protect them because that's our job. And then as I start to go into history and I go I go into study and hear things like what you're saying, and then see this picture of like what? Why are these old Jewish guys? Yeah. The, 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 sitting with Ahmadinejad in in Iran, thanking him, and well, who are the ones that are mad at him? So yeah. something is, and then I see this another picture of like fifty thousand rabbis in the in the black, you know, protesting against the Israeli guy saying something about the Zionist, Zionist government there. So yeah. something is amiss that I I don't quite understand yet. But that you know, the making the sense between Esau and Jacob, you know, mm-hmm. where where he stole the the um you know like I said the, the the two different things the blessing and the title right the title yep. and the blessing and them but but at the at the point Esau didn't really care did he I mean he was was he upset at that or did he didn't really with the with the pottage when he traded for the pottage it was like he could care no less. he didn't really he couldn't care less because at that time he had murdered Nimrod um and 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 grabbed his um uh, if you go into the book of Jasher, he'd murdered Nimrod and grabbed his royal robes, um, which some say were fashioned after the fig leaves that Adam wore um, in the Garden wow. of Eden. But nonetheless, um, he grabbed his uh, um, royal robes, and as far as he was concerned, he he didn't need this, uh, you know, this this uh, funny birthright from the, this this god. He had Nimrod's gear, 
and he and that was going, what was going to give him the power. Um, that's why he was, you know, according to the book of Jasher, he was starving because he'd been on the run from um, Nimrod's kinsmen, uh, you know, trying to uh, trying to kill him in in, in revenge. And uh, that's, you know, this is the type of man uh, that Esau was, as opposed to Jacob, uh, who really valued the relationship with God that the um, birthright and blessing would bring. Um, but Esau was the oldest, so it was going to go to him. But Esau showed the type of guy he was. And to be perfectly honest, Zionist, um, the, the Zionist state is showing the type of people they are, because, you know, any Christian needs to ask this question, all right, that even if they were uh, the people of the book, and even if they were blinded uh, on the basis that they didn't accept Jesus Christ, but they're God's chosen people, when they were brought back to Israel, they were brought back in 1948. But if they were dedicated to being this culture and so on, then something profound should have happened in 1997. And given what we've talked and uh, spoken about all through this, the Israeli state should have declared a jubilee. And it did uh, not. It just continued with the secular crap, um, you know, of just yet another uh, kingdom state, uh, you know, that en engages in all this. They, they are not bringing forth the fruits, you know, of the kingdom. When, when Christ talked about the fig leaf, uh, the fig tree um, flowering, he didn't say it would bear fruit. Uh, this, I believe, was a direct prophecy of what we see in the state of Israel. The, the, the figs. Remember, there were good figs and there were bad figs. Yeah. The fig tree was always the uh, representative of uh, of Judah, uh, whereas this, um, the olive tree was representative of Israel. But it was a fig tree that was cursed by Christ, and he said, you know, when you see it bringing forth the leaves, you know the time is near. But it, 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 being of the bad figs, it would never bring forth good. It would never bring forth fruit. Fruit, right? And I've I've been on this theme all the way through our discussion, Mark. Where if you can't bring forth the fruits, you'll be judged, and you'll go the the other way. So any Christian who wants to um, uh, to bless a Jew uh, based on the uh, you know don't curse them or else you be cursed sort of uh, a scenario really should be telling every Jew that he knows, don't go near Israel. Don't have anything to do with it. Um, you know, get out of there. Instead, what Zionist uh, evangelicals are doing is that they're paying money. They're, they're collecting money to ship Jewish families into this hellhole that is going to, you know, bust aside. And if, uh, if God's prophecies are actually anything to go by, it's going to be destroyed. It's just going to be become a, a, a stubble after the flame that sweeps through it. Um, wow. Old Jerusalem, you know, it's gone. You can't go back to Old Jerusalem. That's, that's, that's old, old thinking. That's not Jer New Jerusalem thinking. New Jerusalem is wherever uh, the living body of Christ and, his, you know, and those that make up that body are. And this is, this is how you know, I'd go about um, blessing. I saw in a similar thing, because I'll correct you, that the Ahmadinejad meeting actually took place in New York when he was over there recently uh, for a statement. Oh, uh, was it? Oh, yeah, 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 that that's right. Forgive me. That's yeah, forgive right. me, you're right. You're... And, uh, you know, to, to me, I'd say, I, I'd point at those guys and say, they're your real Jews. You know, they're, they're the guys that, uh, uh, if, if you want to get to know Judaism, go and talk to that lot. And so on. you won't find a Benjamin Netanyahu amongst any of them. Um, <clears throat> but they... In my opinion, they do actually represent a growing majority of Jews who, you know, to use a Christian term, have seen the light yes. um, of uh, what is really going on. And uh, I saw a, um, a Zionist Jew, to a certain extent, um, Jews since the time of Saul, uh, people of the Jude Judaism uh, faith, uh, I'm talking about Saul who became the Apostle Paul. Yes. Uh, they hated Christian Christianity and they sought to persecute it. Um, and, 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 of course, they hate Christ. Um, they actually, such people of Judaism, actually uh, conform to the, the definition of what an antichrist is. It's somebody who denies Christ was the Messiah. Yes. All right. And, and you know, Saul was one of them at the very beginning. And you've had plenty of them uh, previously. So when I saw this Zionist Jew asked a question about, you know, 
what do you think about support of uh, particularly American evangelicals for the Jewish state? <laughs> he, he couldn't help himself. He came out with it. He said, they're, they're not our friends. They're not helping us. They're only, they only want to do all this because they've got some crazy notion, uh, you know, about if they get us over there, then Armageddon's on the way, and that's when Christ comes back. You know, and I think this is the problem. A lot of evangelical Christians are playing the game uh, that Judas played in trying to provoke Christ into manifesting his powers and getting rid of the Romans. A lot of evangelical Christians are saying, hey, somehow we've got to engineer Armageddon. You know, we've got to back the Zionist state and we've got to create a situation where the Russians are going to come down. And when that happens, then Christ's got no alternative but to return. Wow. Scary. Yeah, it's scary. A lot to think about coming from so many different directions. And uh, it's um, you, you, you wonder what to think anymore, you yeah, know, what, yeah. or how to think and um, who, who not to offend by, but also being able to look at things objectively. You got to, you may have to offend some people. And yeah. um, I'm going to throw uh, one more thing in terms of the sure. state needs with uh, with Christians needs to be understood and that is that when I said that the history of Christianity very much follows the history of the three first kings of Israel Saul going into David going into Solomon all right um, when you look at the uh, changeover uh, the, the the rule of the uh, um, David okay uh, in terms of you can see a parallel of what's going on in the rebellion of Absalom his son and uh, Abinapathol, I think, was the advisor to David. Now, what you have is um, Christ, the son of David, um, who is betrayed um, by a one of his um, followers, a man who had a position of authority within the disciples. He looked after the, the treasury and so on. And so, you know, had some influence and so on. That was, of course, Judas Iscariot, okay? And Judas Iscariot hung himself uh, as a result of his betrayal uh, out of grief for what he'd done. But he betrayed um, the, uh, uh, the Christ to the high priests who believed that they represented, um, you know, uh, the teachings to do with who the Messiah would be and not Christ. OK, so you've got that dynamic happening there. In the time of King David, King David had a had a. Um, an advisor, Abinapathol, who got fed up with David. Uh, you know, David just simply wasn't getting on with the business how he felt it should be done. Pretty similar to how Judas felt that Christ simply wasn't getting on with kicking out the Romans. Yes. Okay, so he starts, he looks at this guy called Absalom, and Absalom has this attitude, all right, which is very, very crucial to understanding this. He's basically saying, he's standing out the gates, if I were king, I would do things differently. I'd do it like this, all right? You know, basically not like my dad. He's, you know, he's hopeless. If I were king, I would I would do this. And a bit of Pathol starts to think, ah, we've got something here. And he backs Absalom in the famous revolt against David, all right? And Absalom ultimately ends up, you know, proclaiming himself king. He goes and he rapes David's concubines. He does the whole works. It's a... You know, it, it really is, um, you know, tragic stuff. And finally, he's killed in battle uh, when David returns to the fold. If you take these two models, Christ remembering being the essence of prophecy, his relationship with Judas and betrayal to the high priests. If you take David as betrayal by Ampenthal uh, to Absalom, uh, where he's, uh, Absalom is conf uh, conferred with the title of king. What you find is that you've got a, a very curious correlation with the church, uh, the Christian church, taking and conferring the birthright name on a group of people who are very much anti the person who is the only person um, who uh, qualifies for that name, Jesus Christ. All right. The, in other words, Christ on his return, all right, is king of kings, but certainly his kingdom is Israel, man under man ruled under God. Okay, the birthright goes through Jacob, down through the histories, into David, into Christ, being the Messiah. 
and the nation that he, the kingdom that he establishes, holds that birthright. By giving the name and and bestowing the name Israel on the Zionists who are anti the Christ, as an anti uh, Jesus Christ, they have effectively betrayed Christ. They've given the birthright to the wrong guys. Wow. You see where I'm going with that one? Okay. So in a sense, the evangelicals are being like, um, uh, who was the I've father, the Jacob? And... They're, being like, they're being like Judas. Wow. Yeah, they're, 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 they're bestowing the, you see, only Christ has the right to establish Israel. All right, and and the thing is, okay, Christ means the anointed. Okay, so yeah. ask any you know person of Judea of Judaism, not Zionist Judaism, but Judaism. All right, who has the right to establish the kingdom of Israel? They'll tell you it's the Messiah. All right, you and I as Christians recognize Jesus Christ as that Messiah. They don't. That's the difference between us and Judaism. But Zionist Judaism is a very virulent form of, of sort of this Esau Amalekite need to appropriate, to, to win back the birthright that they sold and establish themselves as the Messiah. Yeah, it's what a deception. I mean, it's who was the father of Jacob and Esau? Isaac. And remember, Isaac. what it was, it was, it's, it's a deception. But you see, this is this is how God works in His plan and so on, because it was a deception that set Esau off on this, on this almost pathological need uh, to get back what he felt he'd been cheated of. All right, and we're we're participating in that perception in a sense in we America. Are, but, you know, it's actually their right under the law. All right, the Zionists and the Zionist Jews, the Zionist evangelicals, they can give it a go. All right. And, you know, if by some miracle they actually did bring forth the fruits of the kingdom and became a blessing to all nations on the earth, then I stand corrected. All right. In terms of all this. But that's what they have to do. They, they, they will have a set period of time like Babylon has had. To to prove themselves. And if yeah. they fail, it's all over. You know, as I say, I would tell every individual Jew I could. Who, who, who's an Israeli citizen, I would say, get out of there. It ain't going to work long term. And, you know, there's plenty of evidence to show that some of the, you know, the big boys in the um, uh, Anglo banking establishment, including Rothschilds and all that kind of stuff, these guys have a Luciferian uh, ethos where Zionist Judaism has been used by these people. Uh, you've probably heard of the letters of Albert Pike. Oh right. yes. Okay, and Albert Pike, you got you got three morals world wars. and morals and dogma, right? Yeah, and you got three world wars is what he's saying that they'd set up. Okay, and people say the letter is a forgery and all that, but it's incredibly prescient in terms that it was written in the eighteen hundreds. Tracking right. pretty good. Yes, I mean we you know we're we're, we're two world wars and counting. The all forger, right. either way, the the forger Albert Pike was pretty good at prophecy. Yeah, he, he, he you know, <laughs> it, it's exactly it's it's planning. coming out pretty much as as as, as he stated, and f for me, the biggest issue uh, there is that the last part of it uh, is a world war to destroy the faiths of Islam, Judaism, and Christianity. All right, and what better way than to set the Zionist Jews up for a fall that destroys the faith of the evangelical Christians who thought that this was all, you know, going to trigger a return of Christ and uh, and destroys the uh, dome on the mount that the Islam has been told will never fall. You know what I mean? Oh yeah. Wow. I mean, there you've got you know for for people of of that persuasion of faith, particularly evangelical Christians, if that happens, all right, if if the state of Israel ceases to exist in a nuclear holocaust. Uh, which, you know, everybody is sort of, uh, you know, worried about or something like that. Man, have they got a f crisis of faith. But you know what? As far as I'm concerned, uh, they should be even, they should feel even more guilt for all those Jews that they sent there and the mistaken yeah. belief yeah, yeah. that they were fulfilling uh, prophecy. Yeah, I mean, when you, when you take it to that next level, all of a sudden 
all the confusion just clears up and it becomes simple again. Mm. You know, where you take it up to the level of uh, the Luciferian doctrine, the sa satanic, the, the Saturn death cult. Yes, to, yeah, to well, saying exactly. The, the ultimate goal is is to keep you confused on the world level, but just remember on a higher level of abstraction that the real thing is to destroy your faith. Absolutely. Or keep your faith from getting other people um, encouraged by your faith. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I have uh, no problems living with Muslims because uh, many of their laws are very compatible with the ones that I would uh, follow. Uh, you know, there's certain things that I would uh, disagree with uh, in how they go about it. I think they're completely at odds. They, they don't under, they, you know, they've taken spare the rod and spoil the child. Uh, and, and, and the stoning laws of children, all that kind of stuff to the nth degree, when in fact spare the rod, spoil the child simply means give them, give them a marker from which, you know, give them a measure, the rod meaning yes. a measure, uh, by which they can know the difference between good and right. There we uh, are, good, back good to bad. measure. We're back to, back to uh, measures. Measures we're not, again. <laughs> yeah, we're not we're not talking about beating some kid with a with a with a rod. We're talking about instilling in them um, the line between uh, right and wrong. Yeah. Uh, and you know that th this is where I think Islam is in a very mature, uh, immature uh, stage of its development, and so on. Yet Muslims that I've spoken to uh, with regards to this themselves are somewhat aghast at the way that you know. In the way that I'm aghast at fundamental Christianity of the evangelical kind, uh, they themselves are aghast at these uh, fundamental Muslims, um, you know, going about the thing. I, my one beef with the uh, with Judaism uh, is, of course, a theological thing. I accept that Christ was Messiah. They don't, but uh, you know, this is something um, that I don't need to get in a fist fight over with them. Yes. You know, it's uh, and 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 really, honestly, the, the the Jewish guys that you saw meeting with Ahmadinejad wouldn't dream of getting in a fist fight with me the other way. No. You know, it's it, the, the evidence is all there where, where where people can, you know, go about their own thinking and so on, you know, in this world. And, you know, we can choose the paths that we go down and, and, and what we believe to be truth uh, and, and, and what we believe to be right and so on. But there are just basic laws there that are really applicable. And, you know, and I include this with, with any atheist. You know, I, I haven't got a problem with atheists. You know, as far as I'm concerned, everybody's saved. And then when it becomes, uh, if it becomes if and when, depending on your viewpoint, it becomes fact that we're all resurrected. Then for an atheist, it just becomes fact. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? It just becomes, that, that, that's what it is. But I have no problem. I don't have a, I don't have a belief that he's off to eternal torment because he's an atheist. Right. It's just simply a process that he has to go through or she has to go through, you know, on this basis. And I, I think that's, you know, that, 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 that's my own sort of Christian approach to these things. But, boy, I run a risk when I start talking about the Zionist thing. I have very much uh, avoided that and sat in death cult um, yeah. because it, it, it's such a hair trigger. Um, it for, it but, is you know, for so for many for so many yeah. people. And. You know, just the, the the thought about it, or beginning to talk, you can just see people switch off or get afraid, and 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 mm -hmm. you know w whatever it is. I I would like to live in a country where it's open game to talk about anything. Okay, this is Mark, and I'm talking to you after the fact uh, during the editing process as I listen to this. As you can see, we've uh, or here we've just gone through some sensitive and speculative things. Uh, and so some may take offense to it, and I sure hope that if you do, you will write me and tell me if you've got counter data to that. I look at things as uh, one of the things I've learned in therapy is a lot of times people like to hide stuff and, and not tell it, and that can be the key or the keystone to the, the work with people to get the change in their system. So I've learned to, to be able to search for and accept and be okay with all the data going back myself in my past and my life is to say, give me the data. I'd rather have the data going back and searching the history of some of the things that have happened to me in my life with different people. It's like, tell me why, you know, give, give me your sense of why. So personally, again, um, you know, I didn't find it offensive. I look at the data and say, okay, here's everything that I can get and then make my own judgment. Hopefully you do the same. I'd love to hear comments and some more about that. It was near the end. Uh, Troy and I went off uh, on a couple tangents, 
and we were saying goodbye, and he started talking a little bit about Paul being into mixed martial arts. And I laughed at him, but then he went on to explain a little bit. So I put that little piece back in here right after my conversation uh, here. Uh, I'll put that in uh, where we enter in with Paul coming in about mixed martial arts and, and how he knew fighting very well and how he was actually one of those people that practiced mixed martial arts and had trained in it for many years. And then we basically say goodbye. So that's it. And just wanted to come in and make a little break and make that statement about uh, uh, hopefully that uh, nobody found offense and that they got the data. And uh, I'd love to hear some more information. on it. I will be researching this a little bit more and talking to Troy about it again. So anyways, here's Paul, the mixed martial artist. No, that's great. So little things like that, you know, knowing Paul was a mixed martial arts fan, for instance, and things mixed like that. Mixed martial arts. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Pancration, yeah. as they used to call it in his day. Really? Um, uh, yeah, yeah. But see, the whole um, – I, 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 I worked in the fight business um, as a video uh, cameraman uh, when I was in Hong Kong. Uh, I got to know the whole thing. And, of course, there's that, you know, link about uh, the um, – the uh, the you know the good fight uh, you 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 train like a fighter uh, and the runner um, it's a lonely road um, you know to to getting it they they fight for a glory that lasts but a, a time you know we we uh, we train for a, an everlasting glory and so on. but when you read between the lines anybody who's done martial arts training uh, to any degree knows that Paul knows what he's talking about about what a fighter goes through. Um, you know, that, yeah, sure, they get out in there in the ring for that brief moment and the crowd goes wild, but nobody knows the, the months of solitude uh, and uh, just being on your own and the agonies and so on. And Paul equated this with it. And I, it's, it has a lot to do with Paul's travels through roads, these places and so on like that, which were hotbeds. Uh, people think of gladiatorial fighting in Rome as being the most popular. It was actually... Um, mixed martial arts, uh, this sort of wrestling, boxing, fighting, all that kind of stuff. Uh, that was that was the game. Um, be, no, I think it was it was only second to chariot uh, chariot racing um, at the time. And uh, Paul, you know, to use it as an analogy. What I'm saying is that to use it as an analogy for how a Christian should approach his um, his study of uh, the Word and uh, and such. Um, Paul had to know what a fighter went through. It's, it, it, you know, it's, it's not, it's not the analysis of an, of an armchair fan that what's, you know, Friday night fights. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. I yeah. Do. He, 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 he's been there in the gym and he's seen these guys, what they're about. Um, and, uh, you know, he's, and for me, the most important thing that came from that, uh, Mark was when you train in fighting, you're on your own a lot, but when you do have, um, uh, fellowship in the uh, fight game it's usually one-on-one -on -one. you know you, you don't attend you know big rallies or something like that you have you and your trainer uh you and your sparring partner it's one-on-one -on -one. and uh you know this is what we're engaging in yeah you know? i like it that's mm. I, I, hopefully we're we're breaking some ground somewhere you know <laughs> <laughs> all right so how do you want to wrap this up then well, I think that, you know, I'll, I'll maybe I'll include this little, last little bit about the uh, MMA and just uh, include this even and say, you know, this has been yeah. incredible again. We thought it would be a couple hours, and here we are at, you know, over Jeez. six hours again. Yeah, yeah. It's amazing. And, uh, thank you so much for your, your time and your energy and your heart that you put into this. And oh, no, right back at you. It's, uh, um, you know, like I say, uh, the work begins for you in many respects, and uh, I appreciate that. Yeah. Well, thank you, and let's we'll see what happens with the audience with this, and uh, whatever I get from people, I'll send your way so you get an idea of how they're feeling and responding. And sure. let's see what questions come up next, and look for round three. Yeah, sounds good. Yeah. All right, Troy. God bless you. Thank you so much for everything, and it's uh, again my pleasure. And and thanks for the time. Hey, oh, it's it's all my mark, and look forward to maybe another session uh, in the near future. Okay, my friend. You take right. care. Take care. Bye. Thanks. Bye-bye.